All right, so what's popping with the squad today? What's popping, y'all? What's popping? Y'all already know what it be. It's your boy, and we out chill. All right, done with that. All right, today we doing something a little different. Just, just a little different. Um, we reacting, but we reacting to an interview. And because right now, you know, my boy D Smoke killing the game with all his talent and ish. You know, I had to just take a moment to step outside the music. Um, I wanted to hear what he had to say, you know. Um, in this interview, he's talking about, you know, Kendrick Lamar comparisons and a bunch of other stuff, um, which I'm really actually kind of excited to hear, considering the fact that, you know, that's one of the biggest things I do hear from people who do listen to D-Smoke is the fact that, you know, he sounds like Kendrick, you know. And I've heard the same thing about artists like Jid. He sounds like Kendrick or he sounds like Jacob. Like, so I, I want to hear what he has to say about this. So, you know, let's just jump right into it. What's up, geniuses? Welcome back to For The Record. I'm your host, Rob Markman. Now, today's guest is the first ever winner of the Netflix show, Rhythm & Flow. All right, he's known for his wordplay, his storytelling, his melody. By the way, if you have yet to see Rhythm and Flow, I really, really, really suggest you go check that out because I'm not gonna lie, it's a bomb show. And it was done, in my opinion, the way it should be done for you know all these hip hop artists, all these rappers, you know? So I, I was excited to see it. D Smoke absolutely killed in the finale. He absolutely killed all the way through the season so yeah you know is it, it go ahead and check that out you know also chance the rapper cardi b and ti are judges plus a host of other guest judges i i like it the show came together really well and to be honest i want there to be a season two so uh let's get it does it in spanish too it's an introduction for a lot of people but actually he's been doing this for a long time his roots in this music runs deep he just released his latest album black habits I want to welcome Inglewood Zone, super good. Hey, which we brought, which you reacted to. to How you doing today? Man, I'm doing well. Right? Doing well, having a blessed day. Okay. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. I'm, I've been sure. really looking forward to this um, interview, to this moment. Um, you know, that you've done um, Verified a couple of times yeah, with yeah. Genius, with our boy Andres yeah, out there. Andres, my man. Yeah, Shout out to man. Him. So he speaks really good of you, really highly. And, and you know, I think your art and your work speaks for itself. So I was like, it would be dope to chop it up and kind of dissect what's going on. Absolutely. And I'm here for it, man. Right. Yeah. That's what's up. All right. So, you know, for most. Although I'm not going to lie, the kid does kind of sound like K-Dot. He does kind of sound like Kenny, not going to lie. Most people, right? Your introduction came. From rhythm and flow is when, is when you land on a lot of people's radars. But mm -hmm. music has been a part of you, and you've been on this musical journey for a long time. And you come from a real musical family. We're gonna get into that a bit. Yeah, I'm start comparing y'all to the Jacksons because I don't yeah. know nobody in your family who don't do music. Man, man, but that's a high compliment. <laughs> so. When did you first realize that you want to be a musician, though, man? When did that first materialize for you? Um, because it was was in the home. It was very early, you know. So mom. Uh, Mom started teaching us music at like three, four, and five. So by the time I was six years old, I was like, oh, I want to play the piano, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was first. That was before I was like, I want to rap, produce, all of that. And it was just as I continued to be uh, exposed to the different elements of creating music, um, I just wanted to do some of all of it. So at 10 years old, you know, my uncle took me to his house and he had a studio set up in his house. And I saw him make, uh, make music right there and then, you know, transfer to tape. And then I was like, I want to do that, you know? So then I was like, okay, I'm going to be a producer. You know, I started saying that at, at 10. Um, and, you know, in elementary, they always saying like, what you want to be? A firefighter, or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then I'm, I'm in elementary, like a producer. And they're like, what is that? You know, so, wow. um, but it's, it started that early because the people in my family did it. So, uh, and then by the time, you know, I started paying attention to the music game and I saw the Puffies and I saw the masterpiece, and I was like, okay, I wanna, I wanna run an independent label. And that's where, uh, probably in, in like 2004, um, we started our own company, and it was me and my family who kind of just, we started out, we built our own studio, converted my parents' garage into a studio, and from that, you know, got signed to a publishing deal, and we're writing songs for other major artists. And then, um, you know, 
It was on from there. So this is Woodworks. This is Woodworks. That's yes. you're talking about. So Woodworks yeah. is this? It was you, your brother, sir. Wow, that's crazy, bro. I never actually expected him to like, you know, have gone that far back. Like, it, it, if you watch the show Rhythm and Flow, it'll tell you a little bit about his background. But I don't ever recall them like going this far in depth about it. So, yeah, yeah. everybody knows your brother, sir. Yeah. Your other brother, Davion. Yeah. Um, your cousin, part of what works yeah. also, yeah. Tiffany. Tiffany Goucher. Tiffany Goucher. Yeah. Um, and she's worked on her own also with, with Terrace Martin and Layla Hathaway yeah. and stuff like that. Um, you guys was really writing songs like 2009. You wrote a single for Jaheim, no? I did, I did. I actually wrote it what? in 2000, I want to say f four or okay. five. Oh, wow. Yeah, because I wrote it when I was a student at UCLA. So wow. I was sneaking in the practice rooms. I wasn't a music major, I majored in Spanish. So I didn't really have access to the uh, the music room, but I would just go walk through the hallway because it's just like uh, practice room after practice room. And most of them are locked, but it's always one with probably the old busted piano that they leave unlocked and I would just go in there and shed and, and write and whatnot. And so that's where that came from. And then it was years later that, you know, it got picked up and recorded and did what it did, you know, and surprised all of us, you know, so. Um, but yeah, that happened around that time. That's dope. So what, being behind the scenes as a writer and a producer, mm -hmm. did you always have dreams of being in, in, in the forefront? Was that always your goal or, or could, 10 years old, I want to be a producer. Right, right, right. You accomplished that, man. Right. You're writing a producer for Jaheim. Jaheim, legendary, well-respected R&B singer. And I think it was like the first single off of that album. Making that it drop. Man. Yeah. It was really the only single off of that album. And the album did did gold. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if there were other singles, uh, they didn't make as much noise as right. that song did. Um, but, but yeah, I, I used to look up to all the... the the reason I wanted to be a producer primarily is because uh, I follow producers, you know, the Dark Childs, the Timberlands, yeah. the Battle Cats. And to me, that always seemed like the mastermind, you know what I'm saying, behind the music. Mm -hmm. And so um, to answer your question, uh, it wasn't so much that I started off being like, oh, I want to be the one in the forefront. Mm -hmm. Like uh, to keep 100, you know, fame isn't something that I really aspired to have, you know, but it was it was more so more so ownership that was like, OK. Um, I think after after we play songs with major artists and then we didn't always get those calls to go back in when they're working again, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, we're still at somebody's mercy or at the uh, uh, at the mercy of whoever's deciding what's going to be placed. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, you know, if we put out our own music, we decide what gets put on it. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. that's when we kind of shifted directions from writing for other people to be like, all right, we're going to start releasing our own. And sir took it and ran with it, you know, so. Right, oh, yeah, boy, did it. Yeah. Um, okay. Wait, hold on, hold on. I need to, I need to. Wait, what? 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 That makes so much sense now. Hold on. That makes so much sense now. So, Sir and D Smoke are br- Oh, This whole man's- This man's whole family is freaking talented and it's ridiculous. Okay, so how did the show come about? How did Rhythm and Flow? Cause you build a reputation for yourself yeah. um, within the industry, like, and, and, and you have credits under your belt, and you have work and real tangible things to show for your work under your belt. And, um, you know, there's also community in LA. You know, mm -hmm. I, I mentioned Terrace Martin earlier. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, I'm sure you're running in and out of studios, and, and, and you're running into guys that Absolutely. are bubbling at the same time. Um, how did the show come about, man? Yeah. So, um, a lot of so we just released black black habits right mm -hmm. um black habits as a project was probably at least 50 percent done before the show the opportunity to be on rhythm and flow came about so um i had been strategizing with my team like at the time i had what like seven thousand followers right mm -hmm. on, on instagram and you know a couple hundred on youtube just and it was like i had been in this place where i knew the quality of, mu of the music was high but 
you know, the movement, you know, I felt like we needed it at a higher platform. So um, we had strategized on how to organically grow that following before we dropped the project, you know, because we knew it was a body of work that deserved to be heard. Um, so what we decided to do was do a, um, a, a series, a promotional series called Run the Subtitles, where we just did uh, freestyles in English and Spanish over popular beats, you know, explosive or next episode, you know, stuff that as soon as it dropped, people would understand, people would, you know, recognize and be like, okay. And then, um, but then the, the twist to it or the hook to it was that, you know, when I'm rapping in English, I got Spanish subtitles. When I'm rapping in Spanish, I got English mm -hmm. subtitles. So it caught wind, you know, some, you know, Jill Scott saw one and was like, this is crazy, he reposted it. Um, you know, Tyree saw it, reposted it, like, what did I just see? Like, this, this dude's crazy. DJ Battlecat posted it. And then, um, so it was when DJ Battlecat posted it that some of the producers who were at the time looking for talent for the show saw what I was doing and was like, it would be super dope if he did exactly that on the show. So they reached out to me and said, look, fill out this application, go on this, you know, go on this audition in front of the, not the judges on television, but the producers so that you can have an opportunity in front of the judges, you know, Chance, T.I., Cardi, mm -hmm. and then Snoop. Um, it wasn't until that first day that, that I realized Snoop was there, you know, and, um, and of course I had to go through the same process as everybody else, but, you know, they were like, look, if, if you do what you, if you do what it is that we saw you do on your campaign, we imagine that you would go far in this. And, you know, right before, right before that first day we filmed, I was like, man, I don't know what this is. You know, there's mm -hmm. no precedent set. Um, I don't know what the producers. <laughs> See, that's a that's a that's a thing about rhythm and flow. The thing about rhythm and flow was that it wasn't just you know the typical run of the mill talent competition. Like that's what made it so interesting to me and a lot of other people was that it just wasn't you know a regular you know talent show like all these other shows out here. Um, the the fact that this show was really designed for rappers and that there was no clear precedence, no 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 clear uh, uh, roadmap to follow to how this should be done, you know, to separate it from you know the singers and all the other just in general talent competitions out there. Um, the fact that there was nothing to distinct to, to distinguish that the fact uh, it is what really made it interesting, and I really do think it went well because you had all of these different. Um, different rappers coming from different parts of the United States. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. Um, but you had all these different rappers coming from different parts of the United States, and it was just ridiculous to see them all, you know, I guess congregate in one in, in one show where it was actually, um, or they were actually able to showcase their abilities in a way that, you know, they didn't get outshined by people who were vocalists, you know, singing in this competition, by people who, you know, were dancers dancing in this competition. It, it was strictly for the rappers, and they had rap artists on there to judge and to and to um, provide guidance to these to these competitors. So that's that 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 was interesting. The intentions are, and then when they send the contract over. The, the plus side of it was you just win a cash prize. You don't, you're not locked into a contract. You and know? you being about your business early and thinking about ownership at a young age, mm -hmm. that's important to you right there. That Absolutely. stands out. Absolutely. So I don't... See, and that's another thing. All of these other shows like, you know, American Idol, X Factor, uh, uh, all these other shows, there there was that caveat um, where rhythm and, rhythm and flow, they didn't you know, contractually obligate the winner to becoming an artist for whomever was behind the show. They gave them a cash prize. They gave them, you know, experience. They gave them guidance, and they they it, it, they wanted the artist to take that and do what they will with with it and see what comes of it. So that that was also another very good point that I liked about the show. I don't have to get committed to some crazy crazy ass contract. Um, there is a cash prize. Of course, there's a certain amount of visibility from being on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And then I also considered that, you know, with these judges being active artists, perhaps with their reputation on the line, they would defend what they felt like was the best quality artist, you know? So I felt like I had a chance, like, like uh, 
Chance would would somehow defend like, okay, the lyrics have depth to them and have real meaning. You know, T.I. would be able to say, okay, I could sense authenticity when I see it. Cardi would be able to be like, oh, when he rapping Spanish, he's for real. You know what I'm saying? So I felt like I could appeal to the judges. On the on the negative side, we were like, we don't know what the what the producers want out of this show. If they're looking for a young artist, if they're like, uh, uh, we don't know if it's going to be more reality TV than it is performance and documentary yep. moments. Yep. And so um, it's still read, the contract still read standard uh, reality TV language where anything you use can be used on the show, right. whether or not it reflects, and, and it's verbatim, whether or not it reflects poorly on your artistry. So I was like, man, last thing we need is a bad moment in front of the whole world right. because we got a great project. So I, I actually called the producers the day before. I was like, we're not going to do it. Mm. You know, and... Um, and they were like, hold on, I'm going to call you right back. They called a couple people and they called back like, please reconsider. Like, I get what you're saying, but um, there's no boogeyman. Like, do it. Like, if whatever you give us, this is uh, my friend, you know, Bianca Bibbs. She said verbatim, whatever you give us is what we're going to use. Nobody's trying to manipulate your moments into something else. Mm -hmm. So that's when I... See, and that's one of the other things... Like, see, I'm really enjoying this interview. Um, I'm really enjoying hearing him talk about this. Just because of that, I might, you know, go do some research, find what the other final, the other finalists had to say about the show. But um, yeah, I really, I really, I really think that's important to touch on is the fact that when you go into a lot of these shows that are put on streaming platforms, that are put on cable TV, that are put on, you know, this, that, and the other network, um, it's basically reality TV. And when I say reality TV, I don't necessarily mean it's what's actually going on. It's what they believe is going to sell, what they believe is going to get viewership up, what they believe is going to, you know, get that viewer count to rise. So get those ratings in so that the show can continue, so that they can continue making money. And I can understand D Smoke's concern is like, you know, all it takes is, is, is just one just one very small mess up, one very small misquote, one very small, you know, like just all it takes is something minuscule and your career is over before it starts or the traction you garnered is completely out the window. So I can understand where he's coming from. Like this show, on top of it never having been done before, he doesn't know exactly what they're looking for themselves. He doesn't know what, what, what they are going to take, how they're going to spin it, and how they're going to portray him. And as an artist, as somebody who's in the public spotlight in general, it, it, your image is probably the most important piece of you. Um, if you, and I'm not saying that to say that you should care what other people think about you, because in all honesty, all honesty I do firmly believe that, you know, Stop caring what other people think about you because at the end of the day, people are going to think whatever they want. But when you are trying to make a living in the public spotlight, when your living depends on how somebody else kind of, and for a lack of better words, views you, how somebody looks at you, how somebody, you know, sees you, like, it's very daunting to not know what a production team is looking for when they're going to be filming you almost around the clock. Uh, you know, I talked to my team again. We had that, that powwow, and um, we were like, all right, we're going to go in strategically, focus on giving them killer performances. Any moment that's not that, we're falling back, you know, staying in the cut, mm -hmm. you know, so that when we do show up, it's meaningful. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's how we approach That's dope. It. That's dope presence of mind. And, you know, I think a good lesson for young artists who believe it, because the attraction is big, especially when you're looking to, like you said, you had quality music that you believed in, you didn't have such a big audience. Right. When you're looking to grow your audience, that's a major way to do that. Mm -hmm. But at what cost? So to have that presence of mind. Um, nah, man, I tip my hat to that. Bravo. Mm -hmm. Um, what what were you feeling? I, I know as the show started progressing on, like people started recognizing you, right? Like you mm -hmm. started saying, yo, man, he looks like, it started with like, yo, he looked like Sir. Mm -hmm. Yo. Mm -hmm. Nah, that's his brother. Yo, I seen them that uh, perform. How have I never, how did I, like, since I watched Rhythm and Smoke, or Rhythm and Flow, how have I not noticed that D Smoke and Sir, like, how did I not, ugh, I, what, 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 what's wrong with me? What, was that something that you were trying to hide from the show? Like, what was the, 
or was it just you trying to tell your story? Like, what were you feeling when, when people started piecing together, like, again, how your how deep your roots really run? Right. Um, I think what I was doing on the show or what I do in my artistry, it doesn't necessarily require the, the sir plug. You know, I think it's, um, it's a dope moment that we're now in this project giving, you know, we, we tapping into it like, all right, now let's tell you the brother's, the brother's story on our terms, not so much like, you know, sir, I need a plug from you or I need you to build me up. Now it's a moment where we, it's mutually beneficial, you know, so, um, it was very intentional to not like lead with that. Like I did, I could have walked up first episode and be like, what's up? My name D Smoke and I'm Serge brother and I'm about to perform for y'all. Like, <laughs> that shit would have been whack. You know what I'm saying? So, um, and we I went agree. that way as, as kids, you know, it was always because we're competitive. It's always, okay, this is my lane. Oh, you going to do that? All right, I'm going to do this. You know what I'm saying? So um, our music is, is different enough, but I think people can see that common vein um, in the content, you know, right. and, and in, in the character behind the music. It's dope, and, and, and I like the way it played out because it does all really come together Absolutely. on the album. Um, Black Habits, to me, right? Yes. And, and this is just kind of the fit. I've been listening to, to, to since Friday, like, oh. kind of has been really the only album I've been listening to since Friday. Oh. A, in preparation to this, but also there's a hole that it, that it has on you, right? And to me, it's this, like, love story that's filled with tragedy. Yeah. And 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 and, and there's, there's triumph, you know, at the end. Um, and it's a story where you plant the seeds. If you've been following D Smoke, you plant the seeds on um, previous projects. Like for example, when the kids pull up, that first verse. Um, yeah. When the kids pull up, is that written from your dad's perspective? Yes. Oh, so you're writing as if you're your father. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So one of the lyrics, right? Like I got babies at home and they ain't feeding themselves. Bank ain't making no loans to a black man. It's 1987, so that crack jam. So my habit make the cash do a tap dance. My cash do a tap dance, hand to hand exchanges. Got me high as fuck, now I'm eager and dangerous. I can stack it up if I just hit a couple licks. I ain't no bitch, but if I get caught, I'm sure gonna miss it when the kids pull up. So that was, mm. yeah, that's his perspective. It's this self-proclaimed mm. king, you know, that uh, kind of twisted mentality of, of an addict. It's like I can convince myself to do this because I'm, I'm willing to risk so much just for that next, whatever that next moment is, whether it's the next fix or getting a little bit of money. So, you know, you can make something happen. But yeah, so that's that was that kind of, uh, I, both verses are from two different perspectives. It's Pops, then it's, you know, the kids, you know, perspective. And and in all of, even when we go deep with the lyrics, it's like, you know, we, we trying to make it entertaining, you know what I'm saying? In the sense that like a kid is innocent, they don't even know that they're not, you know, everything, the ghetto is heaven to a kid, you know what I'm saying? Bust open the fire hydrant and play in it, you know that's what I'm it. saying? Like, play football on the concrete, yeah. two-hand. I mean, that's straight facts, bro. Like, that just takes me back. Like, I'm sorry, like, that just, like, him making that comment just takes me back to my childhood. Um, play, there, there was never a lot of neighborhood children when I was growing up, but the ones that did, we were all, always, you know, at the park that was literally across the street from my house we were we were you know riding our bikes up and down in front of our house and you know down the alleyway on, on the side of my house and you know there was a basketball court around the corner from my house and we were always shooting hoops and it's just like kids kids are innocent like what an adult sees um all the dangers and all and all that what an adult sees is not what the kid sees you know to to, to me like, that will always be my home. That will always be the place where I grew up. That will always be the place where I, I've had some happy times. Um, but as I get older, it's easier to look back and see all the things that my uncle, you know, tried to tell me, all the things that my aunt and my, and my dad tried to tell me, all the things that my cousin tried to tell me. So, you know, I think that's just beautiful right there. And touch, you know, they don't know. on the mattress. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, if, if I tell my story to somebody who had was well off or had a silver spoon they're like oh my god how'd you do it yeah. but then everybody mm -hmm. else who kind of shared those common experiences they know the celebration mm -hmm. woven through it well, well that, that that's what that's what drew me right because i, I faced a bit of that mm -hmm. a lot of that in my youth when i seen my parents be addicts and mm -hmm. i used to go to na meetings with my dad and wow. see him go to rehab and, and shit like that and i can't believe i just said it on camera because we're taught right 
but keep family business. No matter yeah, what, that's family right, business. Don't yeah. go talking about that. Yeah. Um, did you have to have a conversation with, 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 with your folks before you start sprinkling the story or laying it out? You know what? Uh, not explicitly. I mean, they're, they're so, so much a part of the process that they know what comes out before it comes out. But um, my parents are ministers. So I've seen them stand up in front of crowds of people and tell that story oh, true. with the aims of reaching somebody that might be going through it and thinking that like uh thinking that they're alone in that you know so my parents are this beautiful example of the other side of all of that turmoil you know what i'm saying so uh i really didn't have to ask permission because on so many it's not something they're ashamed of or they